Welcome to the EdTech Show, I'm Dan Spada, and today I'm giving you the guide on how to teach students to research. Today I'm going to be showing you how I teach students how to research. I'm basing this video off of a presentation I created last year called Stop Researching Like My Grandma, which is my fun way of teaching a very serious subject. Um, I have had a lot of success selling these lessons and this presentation on Teachers Pay Teachers, which is why I decided to share this with everybody because even though this video won't go through everything in the presentation, it is going to highlight some of the really important things I think every student should know. To create this presentation, I've gathered resources from all across the internet. Some of it comes from my own anecdotes, some of it comes from other amazing teachers, and some of it comes from Google itself. I always like to start off showing students this short video that explains exactly how Google works, which just gives them a little bit of a framework for understanding how a Google search actually functions. Um, and then I also go over some other information which I won't cover in this video, um, but it is important for students to kind of understand exactly how web crawlers work and the Google search index. Um, and finally, I finish with the actual process, so how search words work, um, and I give examples of how geography plays into this, as well as some other factors. One of the things I spend a lot of time talking to students about right off the bat is this idea that Google says you can't pay for a better ranking which is true. However, what Google doesn't tell young people is that even though you can't pay for a ranking, you can pay to have your website placed above the ranking. Um, and even though that site might not be the best, it appears at the top, which students automatically assume is the first. So one of the examples I give the students is something that they all can relate to and all know about. So I show them when I type in Fortnite into a Google search, the very first thing that pops up is an ad by Epic Games, the creators of Fortnite. Um, and on the side, there's also an ad that shows you how to buy things for Fortnite. Uh, you can see that there's something from eBay and some other stuff. Uh, these are paid ads. And so even though this is Fortnite and something that they know about, when they search, they need to be able to identify the ads from the actual Google search index. So this is the part of the presentation when I tell students an anecdote about my grandma and how when she got an iPhone, she would ask Siri these really long-winded questions that there was no way she could come up with an answer for. So she'd be like, Siri, what was that movie with that girl who went to the circus and saw the tiger? And she'd just go on and on and on. And of course, Siri would come back with a million different things because she had no idea. Um, so I give this example, right? So my grandma might type in, where does Harry live? And the result is Google thinks she's talking about Prince Harry. So grandma types in, where is Harry from? And Google comes back with thinking she's talking about Harry Styles. But that's not what my grandma wanted to know. So grandma needs to stop asking Google questions. And this is the thing that we need to hammer home to students because this is what they do all the time, right? They hop into Google, they ask it the question, they throw in the question mark, and they expect Google to spit out the answer. We need to teach them how to use keywords to be more efficient searchers. So what grandma really wants to know is Harry Potter address. And of course that comes up with Harry Potter's address. So then I give them a few examples. So let's say that my grandma's cat recently started coughing up hairballs all over her rug. Grandma might type in, my cat keeps coughing up sticky fur balls. Is this normal? And we, the students laugh and they get a good kick out of this. However, many of them are still guilty. Some of you guys might actually be watching this and be like, uh, you know, like that's me too. And we might be able to get what we're looking for, right? As adults, we can kind of figure out how to reword things if we don't get what we want. But we're trying to teach students to be efficient researchers. So we need to teach them what words do you actually need? So I give them this example and then we look at it and they all figure out we need cat, cough, fur balls, right? That will give them the answer that they're looking for. Another example I give them is my grandma decides she wants to become an Uber driver. And again, if you guys choose to use this presentation, the kids love these pictures. Uh, so grandma says, how much money can I earn if I become an Uber driver? And they all will, you know, you can ask out a couple students, you can ask one student, however you want to break it down. But the words they identify is earn Uber driver. 
And then you can have a discussion about do you need the word money? Does the word earn imply money? Uh, and you can have that conversation with them. Uh, another example I give them is my grandma decides she wants to go bungee jumping at the Rio Grande. And again, they get a kick out of this because they love that picture. And by this point, they're all really good with this. Um, you know, grandma asks, is the Rio Grande a good place to go bungee jump? And really all she needs is Rio Grande bungee jump. So this is the part of the presentation when I show the students four lessons that Google has for my grandma. And these are four actual things from Google, and it's important for students to know these. And so the first thing I cover with them is every word matters. So we compare who versus the who versus a who. So we'll see that every word matters because every word is gonna produce a different result. So if you just type in who, you get World Health Organization. And I'll actually have the students do this along with me so that they can see it for themselves. Uh, when you type in the who, they get a band, although most of the students have never heard of the who, so it's kind of fun to sing some who for them. And then if you type in a who, you get Horton Hears a Who. And again, for the students to see this is a really powerful thing for them. And this is a really fun one too, because even though they just learned that every word makes a difference, um, it's also good to show them that every letter makes a difference. And I always like to start this off like, what do you guys think? Does one letter make a difference? And they kind of get it at this point, uh, but it's still fun to kind of throw it out there because some students will think, nah, one letter's not gonna make a difference. So I show them, let's look at the difference between zoo and zoos. So when you type in zoo, you actually get quite a bit of information about um, zoo, the TV show, and you see there's some zoos in the area um, that come up right away in the search. However, when you type in zoos, you see that the TV show zoo is completely gone. And now, even though you still have the same zoos on the map, you see in the side, it's just information about a zoo. And you'll also notice that there's relevant news articles, uh, something that we didn't see when we just typed in the word zoo. Word order also matters. This was an example that I saw on the internet um, comparing blue sky versus sky blue. So when I type in blue sky you see that i get um, blue sky the movie there's um, a production studio called blue sky and there's um, a planner however when i type in sky blue i get information about credit repair the color and a soccer team so just switching those two words gives me completely different results and then the last thing we look at is capitalization which does not matter george washington with capital g and W uh, gives me the exact same results as George Washington with lowercase g and a lowercase w. So capitalization does not matter. I also like to give the students some tips. So uh, for instance, like say you're trying to figure out what's that thing that connects the tongue to the bottom of your mouth, you know, that, ah, like that thing. Um, even if you typed in thing that connects tongue to mouth, that's not the most efficient search. However, when you do that, you'll see that one of the first things that comes up is the frenulum. So a good tip and a good researcher will then, once you know that it's called the frenulum, go back up into your search box and type in frenulum because now you're gonna have a more accurate search for what you're looking for. One of the really important things that students need to walk away from this presentation with is knowing that quotation marks can help them narrow their search. So I like to give them the example that uh, my grandma wants to find some tips and tricks on how to be better at bingo. And again, they love the picture of grandma holding up the cash. Um, but when you type in bingo tips and tricks, you get back 17 million results. When you type in um, bingo tips and tricks with quotation marks, it narrows it down to 5,680. So when you show students that using quotation marks brings it from 17 million down to 5,680, uh, it really hammers home the point that quotation marks can be a powerful tool for them to use. Another way to teach students on how to narrow their search is to use the minus sign. So I give them the example, let's say they have a project about lions. When you type in lions, you're gonna get a lot of information about the Detroit Lions, the NFL football team. But if you're looking for the animal, the football team isn't what you want. So if you type in Lions minus Detroit, you're gonna see that now all of your results are just about the animal and the football team doesn't appear anywhere in your results. One of the things I think as educators we forget to really teach students is how to use Google News. 
It sounds kind of obvious, and sometimes students stumble upon Google News in their research, uh, but it can be an amazing tool for students when they're looking for current information about certain topics. So let's take the example of uh, cell phones in schools. If a student types in cell phone schools and they go into Google News or they select the Google News tab, they're gonna get information about cell phones in schools that is happening right now. They don't have to look through tons of uh, different websites and stuff for current information. Google News will have the most current and relevant information that they're looking for. Using the filter in Google News can be even more powerful because now students can find articles from the past hour, day, week, month, year, uh, or even find articles from a custom range. Depending on the age of your students, Google Scholar is something uh, that could be a very powerful tool for them. Uh, something that most students will probably use in college, so high school students should definitely know about it. Uh, I like to at least introduce my middle school students to it, just so they know of it. Um, and at least they can start playing around and exploring it, understanding what it can do. Because Google Scholar has over 150 million peer-reviewed articles from academic journals and books, conference papers, theses and dissertations, preprints, abstracts, technical reports, and other scholarly literature. Um, so it's something that all students should at least know about so that they can start using this in the future. And the last piece that I won't get into um, in great detail here, but I do have an entire another video on it that I recommend you check out. Um, you can click on the link up above or there's a link in the description below. Uh, but this is using Wikipedia in a reliable way. And I know some teachers are very uncomfortable with this, uh, but I'm just gonna give you the brief overview of how I teach students to use Wikipedia. And again, check out that other video for more information where I go into a lot greater detail. But what I tell students is, um, Essentially, you can't cite Wikipedia, but Wikipedia can lead you to a gold mine of resources. And so I use the example of uh, mobile phones and driving safety. So while reading this article, um, I found a great piece of information that I want to use. Uh, so it turns out that State Farm did a study showing 19% of people use the internet from their phone while driving. Now this is a great piece of information that you might want to use in a research paper. However, you cannot take it from Wikipedia. I'm gonna just say that again. You cannot cite that information from Wikipedia. However, there's a little number nine next to that information. And if you click on that number nine, it's gonna take you down to an article from the Los Angeles Times in March, 2011. And if you click on that article, it's gonna take you to a Los Angeles Times article. So to review that quickly, because I went through it kind of fast, I try to emphasize to students that you cannot cite Wikipedia. That information is not citable. However, it is leading you to a Los Angeles Times article that is citable. You can use that information. So what I'm teaching students is use Wikipedia to help you find information that you can then use and cite in your papers. So I always like to just show them this graphic. You can cite the references. It's okay to cite Los Angeles Times. You cannot cite Wikipedia. Um, and again, if you have teachers who are uncomfortable with this, you know, I suggest like sitting down with them first, going over it with them, um, and even show them the video that I have or this presentation, and just kind of showing them we're not teaching students to cite Wikipedia. We're teaching them to use Wikipedia to find some of those credible resources. I personally view research as a journey that students go on across their entire academic careers. And while this is just one stop on that journey, I've found this presentation and this information to be really effective in getting that journey kickstarted. So I hope that you and your students find this information helpful as well. If anybody has any comments, questions, concerns, please leave a comment in the section below or visit danielspada.com for more information and videos. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you next time.